Hello and welcome to the virtual Manfred Olson Planetarium at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. My name is Jean Creighton. I'm the director of the planetarium and it is a great delight in the middle of this terrible winter that we're having to think about Asian celebrations of beginnings and of spring. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Wahoo, who, who is a graduate student at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in physics, and he will be today our guide of China. Um, so how welcome, and uh, let, us, let us begin. Um, this is, after all, a huge country, and uh, it, it's nice to kind of focus on a few landmarks. So let's begin. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, let's begin the journey. Okay, so as you can see, this is the Great Wall of China. Many people know this. Uh, the Great Wall, Great Wall is a series of uh, ancient fortifications. And now uh, it is a big tourist attraction in Beijing, the capital of China. So if you visit Beijing, the Great Wall is a must see. Yes. <clears throat> okay, the Yellow River. The Yellow River, uh, we Chinese people call the Mother River. So it is the birthplace of the ancient Chinese civilization. There's of course another very famous river, the Yangtze yeah. River. Yeah, the Yangtze River is the southern part of China. It is the longest river in Asia. Uh, the biggest city of China, Shanghai, is just next to the mouth of the Yangtze River. And a favorite place of yours in your province? Yeah, Huangshan Mountain. So Huangshan Mountain also you can call the Yellow Mountain. Yellow uh, is in Anhui province. As you can see, this beautiful thing. Uh, it is in my hometown, my home province. It is one of China's major tourist destinations. So this photo, this famous photo is called stone monkey gazing at the sea. As you can see, that's a sea. And uh, a stone monkey, a stone monkey, can you see that stone monkey? That stone monkey is sitting on the top of the mountain and looks at the sea. But I want to remind you, do <laughs> not go down there to play at the beach of that sea. Why, you may ask? because the actual name of this photo, this famous photo is stone monkey gazing at the sea of clouds. <laughs> so there is no real sea for this poor stone monkey to gaze. It is just an illusion of the sea formed by the clouds of the, Huang, uh, of the Huangshan or Yellow Mountain. It is a very, very beautiful place. Yeah. I gather you have not been there quite yet. Yeah, no, no, it is very, I very regret I didn't go there. But how you'll have an opportunity, I'm sure, when our travel becomes a little easier. Describe to us how China is organized from a kind of administrative point of view. Yeah, uh, there are 34 pro provincial administrative divisions uh, classified as 23 provinces and the five autonomous regions like Xinjiang and Tibet and the Inner Mongolia. And, uh, and also we have six special cities like Beijing, Tianjin, Chongqing, and uh, Shanghai, and uh, the Hong Kong and the Macau uh, in the south. The Hong Kong and the Macau are the former colonies of Britain and uh, Portugal. I just want to point out to people who are watching, if you look at these cities, some of these special cities, they, they are huge. They take a significant portion of land. And it's hard for us to imagine yeah. uh, in the West where we live in smaller cities, cities that are quite that large. We thought that since um, how is going to be making references to dynasties and uh, giving us those references might not be obvious to all of us. We thought maybe we'll have a very brief um, description of the most important dynasties that you will be mentioning later on. So please go ahead and tell us about th these very important dynasties. Okay, 
So uh, there are 24 dynasties in Chinese history. Uh, let's look at some main dynasties. So the first one, the Zhou dynasty, you can see is very long ago. Uh, it was the third dynasty in Chinese history. Zhou dynasty uh, laid the foundations of Chinese culture. The great thinkers like Lao Tzu, Confucius, Zhuang Tzu, Mencius, and many others lived uh, in this great period. So which is called in Chinese, the hundred schools of thought. So if you look at the world at that time, the same time, uh, Thales, Socrates, Plato, and uh, Aristotle were living in ancient Greece at that same time. And Buddha, born in southern Nepal, was teaching Buddhism in ancient India. So uh, like a German philosopher called this period, the Axial Age, so it was a great awakening of human thought. If I could time travel to just only one dynasty of China, I will choose the Zhou Dynasty. Uh, so the Han, the second, the Han Dynasty, uh, many people will know. Uh, in China, there is one, there is a, a majority ethnic group called the Han Chinese. It is about 92% of the whole, uh, the total population. I am a Han Chinese. And uh, the Chinese language in China also uh, is known as the Han language. And the written Chinese is referred as, to as the Han characters. So the Tang Dynasty was a, a high point in Chinese civilization. Speaking of the Tang Dynasty, the first thing that comes to mind is the Tang poetry. We will see later. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Song Dynasty uh, actually was another great, uh, another golden age in Chinese history. The Song economy was very strong. Generally, the people lived a happy life. And then we have the Ming Dynasty and the Qin Dynasty, uh, two very recent dynasties. The Qin Dynasty is, uh, was the last dynasty in Chinese history. Tell us a bit about the flag. Okay, so the flag of China is often known as the five-star red flag. The red background represents the Chinese revolution and the five stars represents the unity of the Chinese people under the leadership of the Communist Party of China. My favorite part is food, and you're going to give us a sense of some of the food that's familiar, something you would eat all the time, and something that would be perhaps a little more special. This, you told us, is your favorite everyday kind of food. Yeah, this is our everyday kind of food. Uh, it is called a twice cooked pork. So as the name suggests, you cook the meat until it is done. You then fry it along with usually the green pepper and the bean chili sauce. It is delicious if you like spicy food. Okay. This okay. is a beautiful picture and it's, I think it's, well, please tell us. Yeah, so it is called Dong Po Pork. Uh, Dong Po Pork is named after a famous Chinese poet, the Su Dong Po, who lived in Song Dynasty. The pork is cut thick, about five centimeters square, and should consist equally of fat and lean meat. Su Dong Po likes Dong Po Pork. <laughs> This looks to me a bit like a piece of art, um, and you can explain to us how it's viewed by others. Yeah, it looks great, but not everyone likes the taste <laughs> of the central egg. Uh, it is a Chinese preserved egg product, but I like it, so you must taste it by yourself, then you will know. And uh, the tofu originated in China about 2,000 years ago. It is made with soybeans, a very healthy food. I also like it. This, this is a beautiful presentation to boot. 
Now, I must say, when I look at this, you mentioned that you love hot pots and you love the the kind of communal nature it has. It's particularly attractive now that we're so often eating by ourselves. Yeah. Hot pot is actually a cooking method. So you put a hot pot in the middle of the table, as you can see, in the middle of the table, and uh, a full of flavored broth is kept simmering. And then you place many kinds of vegetables, meat, mushroom, corn, lotus root slices into the pot to be cooked. So you and your friends, your colleagues or family sit together around the pot, especially in cold weather. You uh, talking and eating. So isn't it a great fun? So the warm atmosphere makes the people feel comfortable and relaxed. Uh, so hot pot is not only a foodie thing, it is also a social thing. Yes, very attractive right now. Um, food, of course, is the base of many of our celebrations. And we'll start with the reason why we're here today to celebrate a spring festival, the Chinese New Year. Tell us about that. Yeah, Chinese New Year uh, is also called the Spring Festival because as you know, the spring is coming. Uh, it is the most important festival in China. Uh, its origin was as old as the Chinese civilization. The highlight of the Spring Festival, in my opinion, uh, the highlight is the annual reunion dinner on New Year's Eve like this picture showed. So the family sits around, around the table, usually around the table in China. They're talking about the lives of the passing year and uh, expressing their wishes for the new year. So here, uh, there's one point very important in Chinese culture I want to mention. The round shape. In this picture, a whole family sits around the round table. So round shape, in, in China, uh, symbolizes happy reunion. Uh, so everybody is here together, right? So if you are in China during the Chinese New Year, you will often hear two words, uh, that is going home. So, and you will witness the largest annual human migration in the world, uh, the Spring Festival travel season. So nowadays, Many people in China work in bigger cities uh, for a whole year, far away from their hometown. Uh, Spring Festival may be the, their only chance to reunite with their families. So no matter how hard the travel is, people would want to go home for the reunion dinner on New Year's Eve. Yes. Uh, this is a festival that's, I think, less known. Um, tell us about how, we on, how you honor uh, ancestors. Yeah, the Qingming Festival is also known as the Tomb Sweeping Day or Ancestors Day. So Chinese people respect the, their parents, their grandparents and ancestors very much. So this is an important tradition and culture in China. This festival allows them to express the, this feeling so the Qingming Festival has been observed in China uh, for over 2,500 2, years. Wow. This in the West, the Dragon Boat Festival is a little more known. Um, what is interesting to me is why it started, how it started. Tell us about that. Okay. So the Dragon Boat uh, Festival is to honor uh, of famous China's first patriotic poet, Qu Yuan, who lived in the third century BC and uh, committed suicide by jumping into the river after the scene his country was occupied and ruined. So local people admired him. They raced out in their boats to save him. This is the origin of the dragon boat race. When his body could not be found, people dropped sticky rice, as you can see, the sticky rice into the river so that the fish would eat them instead of Qu Yuan's body. So this is the origin of the zones. 
a traditional Chinese food, very delicious. So the sticky, uh, the sticky rice is wrapped in bamboo leaves. This festival I know because it's connected to the moon. So this is the Changje. Um, please, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. Changge. Say, thank yes. you. I should know how to say this because after all, there is a um, there is a mission China is sending yes. to has sent missions called Changge to the moon. Um, yes, so tell right. us about the mid autumn festival. Okay, so this festival is also known as Moon Festival. Uh, it is the second. It is the second most important uh, holiday after the Chinese New Year, uh, with a history of three thousand years. So on this day, the moon is the brightest and the roundest. So as I have said, the round shape symbolizes reunion, happy reunion in Chinese culture. So ancient Chinese, when they saw the moon, the round moon in the sky, they would think of reunion in the earthly world. So in mid-autumn festival, people will appreciate the moon uh, in the evening to miss their family members who are maybe now in other places. For example, I am now in Milwaukee, USA. My family is in China, but we all enjoy just the same moon. So if I look up to see the moon now, if I look up and uh, we can imagine that my family is also looking up, seeing the same moon right now. So what do you think? I will appreciate the moon that it brings some connection between me and my family. So this is a Chinese way of thinking about the moon. Very heartwarming. Um, China has, of course, a lot of art forms in the interest of time, we thought it might be sensible to uh, talk about art forms that are very particular to the Chinese culture. Poetry, of course, being so important. Yes, Tang Dynasty uh, was the golden age of Chinese poetry. So poetry entered the daily lives of the whole people. People admired the poet uh, at that time. Even today, in ordinary Chinese families, usually the parents will let their children to uh, memorize Tang poems from an early age, such as this very uh, popular poem by the greatest poet in the Tang Dynasty, Li Bai. So at first, uh, let me say something about the Chinese characters. So writing in China basically hasn't changed for 3000 years. They are written in, uh, in to fit into a square. So they are also called square characters. Every character is just like a two dimensional picture. So this poem has four lines. Every line has the same five characters. It is very neat. So uh, a typical Tang poem usually should be like this. In some cases, you may uh, you can have more lines, but usually in every line, you have the same five characters. So let me uh, read this poem in Chinese, uh, typical way in Chinese. 床前明月光,疑是地上霜,举头望明月,低头思故乡. So in English, before my bed, there is a pool of light. I wonder if it's frost on the ground. Looking up, I find the moon bright. Then bowing my head, I drown in homesickness. So you can see uh, the Chinese people, when they see the moon, usually they will miss their family members, their hometowns. Beautiful. <clears throat> this, I guess, is culture that's turned into television programs. Tell us about this yes. one. Yes, yes. This uh, uh, is a 16th century novel. Uh, it's about a Tang Dynasty Buddhist, the man on the white horse. He traveled in 1629 from China to the West. That was the Asian India. 
to obtain Buddhist text and then returned China in 643 after many difficulties along the way. So people in China, uh, this, this series, this TV series and this book uh, are very, very popular in China. Ah, yes, and a special musical instrument. I just want to say, because I think my sister-in-law is watching this, she has one. She plays one of these. Go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, so, gu, so this is Gu Qin. Gu Qin is, uh, is sometimes called the father of, the chi of Chinese music. So there is one famous piece. It's called the Flowing Streams. In Chinese, Liu Shui. In English, Flowing Streams. It was composed 2,500 years ago. So let's listen. Gorgeous. I know how proud you are of your hometown opera house. Yeah, yes, indeed. The Huang Mei Opera, you may have heard the Peking Opera, uh, was the Beijing Opera, but the Huang Mei Opera is one of the five most famous operas in China. It originated in, in my hometown, the Anhui province. So one famous piece of the opera fairy couple. So as you can see uh, on this stage, there is a couple very happy. So this, uh, this opera is about a happy couple who love and respect each other. They are returning home together. So let's listen. I must say that scene is so inviting with all those beautiful colors, makes you want to go there. Speaking of places, we're going to look at a variety of uh, different buildings and environments in China, starting with a rural setting. Yeah, so this is a typical village in Southern China. The main features as you can see are a small bridge, a water and the cottages. So personally, I like to live in a place like this when I am old. <laughs> yes, quite different from this city. Yeah, so this city, Shenzhen. So Shenzhen, China's fourth largest city, uh, is a southern coastal city, very close to Hong Kong. So just 40 years ago, it was a small fishing village, very poor like other places in China at that time. So in 1978, the chairman Deng Xiaoping said, poverty is not socialism. So he decided to reform the economy and, and open China. So Shenzhen was then established as China's first special economic zone. There is a famous song in China, the story of spring, it says, in 1979, uh, that was a spring. There was an old man who drew a circle on the south coast of China. So the old man is Deng Xiaoping, the circle is Shenzhen, the special economic zone. So because of the success of Shenzhen, the spring breeze of reform belongs to the whole mainland of China. Uh, if you once saw China in 1978, then uh, never really see it again. If you visit China today, I'm sure uh, you certainly will not recognize China. Mm -hmm. um, 
This is a Buddhist temple of, of significance. Please tell us about it. Yeah. This White Horse Temple is the first Buddhist temple in China, established in Han Dynasty. So Buddhism uh, is not a usual religion. It is a philosophy and education, teaching people how to get real happiness. So then, although most Chinese are not Buddhist, uh, Buddhism has a great influence on the Chinese culture. Many everyday idioms come from Buddhism. So for example, like uh, all living creatures are equal. Good will be rewarded with good, evil will be rewarded with evil. Saving a life is of boundless beneficence. This is a city, a picture that we've seen before, as you, as you like to say, it's not forbidden anymore. Please tell us about the history of this uh, palace. Yeah, this is a palace. This was uh, the palace of the emperors of China from the Ming Dynasty, 1420 to Qin Dynasty. So in 1924, the last emperor of Qin Dynasty was expelled from the Forbidden City. So now it is a famous uh, tourist attraction. Uh, if you visit Beijing, you have to go to, to see this. It is, it is very, this is only a part of it. Uh, it is actually is very big. The palace you mean? Yeah, I mean, this is only in a part, only in a very small part. If you visit, if you, as, because I know the forbidden city, it is a city. Mm -hmm. you know? Beautiful. Um, some of the people you've mentioned, the philosophers from the era that you would like to go back if you were a tram tra time traveler. Um, so we'll start with Lao Tzu. Okay, so uh, Lao Tzu and uh, Confucius are the two great, uh, great teachers for Chinese people. They are the origins of what Chinese people are thinking and behaving today. So to understand Chinese people, uh, we need to know about these two masters and their thoughts. So I very like, uh, I'm very happy to share with you the, the thoughts of Lao Tzu. At first, Lao Tzu lived in sixth century BC. He was 20, uh, 20 years older than Confucius. Confucius admired him uh, very much. He wrote the famous book, Dao De Jin, also popular uh, in Western countries. This book has only about 5,000 words and it is Lao Tzu's only book. It is said that when Lao Tzu was old, he left the home on a water buffalo. As you can see this picture, Lao Tzu on a water buffalo heading west. No one, no one knew where he ended up. So before leaving, Lao Tzu wrote his single book, the Dao De Jin. So these two sentences, uh, one out of Dao, one is born. Out of one, two is born. Out of two, three is born. Out of three, the universe is born. So this sentence, there is a, a, a concept, Tao, D-A-O, Tao. So what is Tao? Uh, the Tao actually is the principle and the origin of the universe. I think this is a deep reason why the mainstream Chinese society does not believe in a personified God, but the principle that is hidden in nature, which is named Oh, by Lao Tzu, 2,500 years ago. Uh, the, famous, the famous 17th century Dutch philosopher, uh, Spinoza, Spinoza, his pan, pantheism, which Albert Einstein also believes in, because I am a, I'm a physical student, I know it. Albert Einstein also believes in the pantheism. I think, uh, resembles Lao Tzu's Tao in some sense. So this will help you to understand what is Tao. So the second sentence, human beings follow the earth. The earth follows the sky. The sky follows Tao. Tao follows what is naturally so. The second key concept in Tao De Jin is De, D -E. uh, De means morality. So where does morality come from? Lao Tzu believes it is from Tao, from the law of nature. So in Chinese culture, people worship earth, sky, and nature. 
and uh, learn from nature how to behave in society, how to live in harmony with others. So in, instead of saying thank God, Chinese people will say thank the sky, thank the earth in everyday lives. Hmm. Very good. Um, tell us about Confucius then. Okay, Confucius uh, certainly uh, very, very famous. Mm -hmm. uh, Confucius was the greatest, uh, I will say, educator. His teachings have been integrated into the daily thinking of Chinese people and the culture. So here are two sayings of him. The first one, what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. So this is the essence of Chinese morality. Uh, from 1840, the first uh, opium war with Britain to 1949, the founding of the People's Republic of China. This period, not long ago, we call it the century of humiliation. So Chinese people almost became slaves of foreign powers and the invaders. The first line of the Chinese national anthem is arise those who are unwilling to become slaves. So in 1842, after the first opium war, Hong Kong was ceded to Britain. So in 1860, after the second opium war, the old summer palace was sacked and burned to the ground by British and French troops. The famous French writer, Victor Hugo, described the looting as two robbers breaking into a museum. One has looted, the other has burned. So in 1860, outer Manchuria was ceded to Russia. 18, 1887, Macau became a Portuguese colony. 1900, the Eight Nation Alliance invaded China. 1931, the Japanese invaded Manchuria of China. Uh, during World War II, Japan invaded China in full scale. Many parts of China were occupied and ruined. So Nanking was the capital of China at that time. The most notorious is the Nanking massacre or the rape of Nanking in 1937. So China has a slogan today, never forget the century of humiliation. Chinese people never forget the century of humiliation, not because they want the revenge, not because they want hatred, but because they want to remind themselves they need to reunite, to reunite together to build their country, to be able to defend themselves and to defeat any possible invasion in the future. So they do not want to go through another period of humiliation like the war from 1840 to 1949. China had several golden ages in history. People today are striving for the renewal uh, of the Chinese nation. So China is a rising power today, but it is also a nation that has a long tradition of admiring peace. So colonizing or invading other countries is not in the Chinese gene. Chinese people taught by Confucius really believe and really hope that people can coexist peacefully in harmony rather than bullying each other. So what do you do? Not one down to yourself, do not do to others. Chinese people know how the century of humiliation tastes China will never let other countries experience a century of humiliation. Uh, China is not a threat to the world. China is a promoter of peace and harmony. So the second of, uh, sentence, uh, what you know, you know, what you do not know, you do not know. China's radical change is a, is a very recent thing. Just 40 years ago, once China was poor and closed, Deng Xiaoping, knew that he knew something and didn't know something. He encouraged the people in China to emancipate minds, seek truth from facts and keep, peace, uh, keep pace with the times. So a famous saying of him is, it doesn't matter whether the, the cat is black or white, 
as long as it catches mice, it is a good cat. <laughs> so, so he learned from other countries. He learned from capitalism uh, to reform uh, economy. So learn from anything as long as they are beneficial to China's development. He said, development is the absolute principle. So at the same time, uh, he would avoid mistakes or failures of other countries or capitalism. Uh, I like ancient Greek uh, philosophy of nature very much. Uh, there was a famous philosopher, uh, Heraclitus. Heraclitus. Mm. Yeah, do you, know, do you know him? Herod, yes, yes. Yeah, yes I, I I, I'm sure you know, it, know him, right? So he once said, everything flows. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, everything uh, changes. Nothing stands still. So China today is not the communism people used to know. Don't be misled by just the abstract word. Don't judge a book by its cover. Don't look at the words statically. So China uh, uh, is socialism with Chinese characteristics. The most fascinating part is uh, with Chinese characteristics. But speaking in my way, China is socialism with uh, learning civilization, learning what is good, but avoiding what is bad from his own long history and also from other countries in the world. So this is why Confucius is so great, so welcomed in China. Yes, um, I invited you to include a, a female person and you chose um, a female empress from a very enlightened time. Yeah. Tang Dynasty. Tang Dynasty is a golden age of China. So because that, that was a golden age, so there was, uh, in history, the Wu Zetian, this woman, Wu, his, uh, her name is Wu Zetian. She is the only empress to rule China in the history. Uh, she is well known in China. So you, 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 can't, you, you, can, you can't imagine that. Uh, for Asian China, it is a, a very conservative uh, society. But, uh, but then in Tang Dynasty, we had a uh, woman empress. Yeah, which is hard to do today, even in, even in this part of the world. <laughs> um, so the connection you've already explained that the moon is such an important part of, uh, of, the, of the Chinese psyche. Um, but you're going to tell us how even stars are connected to a beautiful story. Yeah, speaking of the connecting with stars, uh, I will say we have a, a very beautiful story and a, and a festival. So the cowherd and the weaver girl. So, uh, okay, so here we have a couple, a folk tale of love, the cowherd and the weaver girl. The cowherd symbolizes the star Altair. The weaver girl symbolizes the star Vigor. Their love was not allowed. Thus, they were banished to opposite sides of the Milky Way. So the Milky Way, the Vigor is in this, on this side, the Altair is in another side. So when Chinese people saw this, they will imagine the story, the cowherd and the weaver girl. So once a year, on the seventh day of the seventh month, a flock of magpies, hence the magpies, the magpies uh, will form a bridge to reunite this couple, these lovers, for just one day. So this is the origin of the Qi Xi festival, the so-called Chinese Valentine's Day. I know the, in the Western countries, the, the Valentine's Day is not so far. <laughs> That's true. I do want to point out in case uh, people know, the two stars that you mentioned, Altair and, and Vega, are two of the three stars in the summer triangle that until, um, well, 
until the end of November, we could see in the Western horizon. These are beautiful, bright stars. And in the summertime, Vega is way overhead, uh, which of course makes the story um, great to look for them at that time. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank you, Hao Wu, for this wonderful presentation. We do, of course, encourage our listeners to put questions in the chat box. I would like to thank our lovely audience who is here and attending you. Uh, the College of Letters and Science at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and the Center for Gravitation, Cosmology and Astrophysics, uh, who... Um, support the planetarium. The first question that we have uh, set up for you is what do you miss most about China? Okay, uh, I, I, let me answer this question. Uh, if you ask me what I miss most, um, I miss most the convenience of daily life in China. Uh, one is the transportation, one is the cell phone. Hmm. Uh, among cities, I can take the high-speed railway to everywhere in China, extremely fast and cheap. So for example, from Shanghai to Hefei, the city where my family is living, uh, it took about nine hours with the ordinary train before, but now it only takes two hours. So when I go back to China next time, I will fly 14 hours from Chicago to Shanghai at first. Then I will take the high speed train two hours to Hefei, my city. After arriving Hefei station, I will take the subway. Uh, when exiting the subway, I don't want to find a bus or a taxi. I will find a shared bike just near the subway uh, exit, then I will take out my phone. I open the app, scan the <laughs> QR code on the bike, and then the bike is unlocked. Uh, then it is my bike, right? I will ride my bike home. I can, just, uh, I can just leave the bike on the street near my home. So it is very convenient. Wow. And uh, in China, uh, when I go outside, I only need to, uh, to bring my, my phone and I can use it to, to pay for, for shared bike, uh, shop, shopping, uh, restaurants, tickets, hospitals, uh, even streets, vendors, and almost wow. everything you can imagine. So paying with phones is not new in China today. Instead, paying with cash is a new <laughs> and real thing. <laughs> Wow. Um, what would be your favorite place to visit? Uh, that will be surely the Yellow Mountain, the Huangshan Mountain. So Yellow Mountain, of course, although it is in my home province, but I had never been to Yellow Mountain. I did not realize its beauty. Uh, my wife realized and she wanted to climb Yellow Mountain. But every time I disappointed her. Now, uh, when I uh, look back, I find that Yellow Mountain is such a beautiful. I will go there with my wife, perhaps also with my parents. When I am back home, I also really want to meet that poor stone monkey <laughs> sitting and gazing there for thousands of years. I will yeah. want to meet that poor monkey. We'll need to see the picture when the time comes. Um, do we have other questions, Victoria? Yeah, we have a question from Awad who said, nice presentation and wants to know what is the origin of the name China? Uh, yeah, China. Maybe a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, to, my own, to my knowledge, I know China uh, in Chinese is from, uh, literally mean China. Uh, Zhong Guo, Guo is a, a country. Zhong, what does Zhong mean? Zhong is a middle. So Ch China in Chinese language is a middle kingdom. Uh, or the, the kingdom in the middle place or something like that. It, uh, it originated from the Zhou dynasty. We have seen that dynasty before. 
the dynasty Lao Zi and uh, Kong, uh, Confucius lived. Zhou Dynasty. Yeah, I think this is the answer. Zhou Dynasty is the uh, origin of China, the name of China. Okay. But people, but the people don't usually call them um, call China. Back at that time, they just call the dynasty, right? Zhou Dynasty, Song Dynasty, Tang Dynasty. Okay. Andrea says, thank you very much. Happy Chinese New Year. And would like to know why, why is the color red so important in China? Because, uh, you know, the flag, the flag is uh, uh, the background of, of the flag is, is red. Because red in China, I think uh, one thing as the as flag symbolized the Chinese revolution. Because as I say, we have experienced the century of humiliation. So, so Chinese want to uh, remember that part and to remind themselves to the build the country. But another point I want to say, why red is so popular is because, as you can see, the Chinese New Year. The Chinese New Year, you will see a lot of red elements, right? Because uh, in Chinese culture, red means something uh, you, you, will, you want to enjoy with many people. So then you are not alone. Uh, many people on, on the streets, many people maybe in, in the house, they, they will talk and they will eat together. And uh, that kind of atmosphere, uh, if we want to find the color to represent this, we will use the red. So if we think of red color, we will think uh, many people were loud or talking. And, Celebration, uh, right? Yeah, I will not be alone like that. Right. Symbol of vibrancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a Happy New Year from Peter and also Happy New Year Thank from Ahmad. And um, earlier we had a hello, hello moon from Kyle and Aaron. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions right now. I, I have a, a, well, actually I'll give a p uh, moment for people to um, think about questions. I just want to say that this is uh, one of a series of programs. So we have Iran, India, and Japan coming up in the next two months. Um, I also want to, that's interesting. Hold on. Um, Meanwhile, we did get another question from Heather. What kind of pets do you have in China? Uh, actually, I, I don't have any pets. Uh, when, I, when I'm very young, when I'm a little boy, I really want to raise a, a, a cat. Actually, I like, I, I, at that time, I like a cat. But when I, I, I am not young anymore, <laughs> I, I don't have the chance. Right. right. Um, I, I just want to say uh, verbally that we're also, um, we're having other programs, uh, the Northern Lights in March, we're having a program to celebrate next week the fact that Perseverance is going to land on Mars on the 18th. So we're having a program on the 17th and the 19th. And we're also having a program about how to grow food on the 24th, I believe, of February. Is that correct, Victoria? I think. Yeah, that's how to uh, research on growing food in space. Right. Um, I have a question for for how, because uh, we had this conversation before um, that was interesting. How does, how does this reverence to older people, ex how do you experience that personally? What does that look like to, to honor your grandparents? Uh, yeah, uh, in, in Chinese culture, uh, respecting the older people, uh, your parents, or your grandparents and uh, or any other older people is very important in Chinese culture. Oh, okay, I want to tell you a little story about my grandmother. Uh, my grandfather died uh, when I was only one year old. And then my grandmother lived with us. Sometimes uh, I would be a very naughty little boy <laughs> and made my grandmother angry. So, and then when I, I, grew, I grew up, and uh, had to go to college into, uh, in a city far away from home. 
I only came back home once for the Chinese New Year. I remember every time when I had to go back to school, I would go to my grandmother and told her, Grandma, I'm leaving. She was actually very old at that time. And she would come out to see me off and watch me get in the car. Then one year, uh, when I was in a city, uh, also uh, far away from home, one day my dad told me uh, that uh, my grandma had passed away. Suddenly I cried hard. Uh, many years later, now I realized that my grandma, when she died, she was uh, 93 years old, so old. When the person is this old, I should realize that death is, is not far away. And you probably not see her or him again. When you wave a hand and say goodbye this time. So I totally didn't realize this back then. This is a, a, a regret in my life. Yes. Um, but you, you still have, do you have two grandparents who are still alive? Yeah. Uh, the grandma, I have told you about this story, is the grandma and grandfather uh, on my father's side. On my mother's side, uh, we still have my uh, grandma. And uh, my grandma will live, uh, will live with uh, her children. My mother and my mother's brothers, uh, for example, uh, my, uh, my grandma has lived with my mother in my, in my home uh, for, the, for the last uh, several months. And for this new year, she will come back to her son to celebrate the new year, happy new, the new year. Good, so you can cherish her while she's still, she's still alive. Yes, that's yeah. great. Um, do we have any other questions, Victoria? There aren't any other questions. I have a personal question though. Okay. So I, years ago, got um, a visa to go to China. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> yes, yes, it felt like a lot of work and I had to figure it out, but, yeah. um, and I was planning and then lots of things got in the way. Of course, COVID is one of those things. And, um, but anyway, I, be, had begun, you know, planning my trip. And then I realized China is huge. It's a huge country. There's yeah. lots of things. And I especially like uh, seeing things that are kind of natural, like kind of remote, hard to get to. So I'm wondering if you have suggestions or advice for how to get around in China when you're trying to see something that's sort of, it's not in the city, sort of, far from the city. You mean- Like how, the mountains, like the mountains you, that you mentioned. You mean how to get there? How to get there, yeah. You mean for example, uh, yeah, uh, like I said, the, the Yellow Mountain, right? The Huangshan yeah. Mountain, I think you, that, that is uh, the place you, you, you should go if you want to see the mountains. Because in China, the Yellow Mountain is the greatest mountain, is the uh, uh, most beautiful mountain in China. So you, you are asking how to get there, right? Yeah, or other kind of like parks or natural um, natural places, I guess. Uh, other places or? Other mountains, other mountain ranges uh, or- Other or mountains, uh, apart from Huangshan Mountain, actually there are, because China is huge, so there are many mountains uh, like the, Huashan uh, uh, in the Shanxi province and, uh, and uh, the Songshan in Henan province and the Taishan in Shandong province. So, uh, so speaking of the Yellow Mountain, if you want to go to there, it's very conven convenient. Uh, because I have said, uh, you fly, maybe you're flying from, maybe from Chicago to Shanghai then from Shanghai, you take the high speed train to, I think you should go to Hefei uh, because Hefei is the capital city of the Anhui province, the capital city. Because Huangshan Mountain is not in the capital city of Anhui province, it's in a city yeah. called Huangshan. 
That city is also called Huangshan, Huangshan city, because Huangshan is so famous. So Huangshan city, uh, you travel, uh, I think you should take the take the train from- so there's, a, there's a train that goes to sure, that? Sure, yeah. China, I have said China is very con convenient transportation. You travel yeah. from, from Hefei station, taking the train, very uh, convenient and cheap, from Hefei uh, station to Huangshan city station. I think the hour, uh, the time is maybe one hour or two hour like that. Then okay. uh, if you get the Huangshan city, then you will take, maybe you will take a bus, take a bus. It okay. is very convenient. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I had, if it was some places you could only get there by car, which I wouldn't have probably. So I would want uh, to use a train or a bus. I think uh, every everywhere in China you can take the the public transportation, like a bus, like a train, okay. like a, like a bicycle, maybe. Uh, 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 but some some places, if you 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 also can you can rent you can rent some some car, or take the in China there is a I think it's a the Uber in in USA, right? Mm -hmm. In USA, we have Uber, is it called Uber? Yeah. So, uh, in China, we have a DD, DD taxi. DD taxi is just like the uh, Uber, or I should say Uber. Uh, you take that, uh, take that uh, in China, can get you to anywhere if there is no public transportation. Good to know, good to know. I'm looking forward to it once, once we can return to traveling. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Well, I think we're coming up on the hour. I don't see any other questions. Um, did you have anything else, Jean? No, but I would like to thank again Hao Wu for doing such a beautiful job of describing his country. I know that, um, and I, I hope you don't mind if I say that you actually had to do some research. It's funny how when we're asked to talk about our country, sometimes we want to kind of get more information and. And I appreciate the time that you spent. Maybe you can tell us for the last thing, what is your research about? What are you doing um, for your research for your PhD? Uh, my research is, from, uh, is about, the, about physics. I, I love physics from a very young age. From, and then from high school, I, I have decided I, I will study physics as my career. So I come to US to study physics and uh, study physics can know the secret of the nature, right? We Chinese people love to worship sky, worship earth, worship nature. So I also like, uh, want to know more about the nature. So that, uh, that's why I choose physics as my research area. All right. Well, very good luck to you. Thank you again. Thank every, Thank you all for being here. And we hope to see you again very soon. I also will thank, of course, Victoria, who uh, makes sure that all everything goes as smoothly as it does. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I also want to add one, one sentence. Uh, okay. Uh, Confucius said, I always say the Confucius. Confucius said, friends come from afar. Isn't it joyful? <laughs> so the Chinese people are warm and friendly. China is a fast growing and fascinating place to visit. Uh, it is extremely safe. Seeing is believing. So welcome to visit the real China. Thank you. <laughs>